Hey folks, Edder from Brain Pulp TV, and it is, as of this recording, just after midnight on April 27th, 2019. It is the pre-release weekend for the newest expansion for Magic the Gathering, War of the Spark. Now, as is the case with most of the new expansions that have come out, there are two new Planeswalker decks that have been released along with it. In this case, Gideon the Oathsworn, which is a white-black deck, and Jace Arcane Strategist, which is a blue-green deck. So what I like to do when these new Planeswalker decks are released is open them up, show you guys what's inside, then go through the deck card by card, talk about the strategy, the thought behind the deck, as well as, in a lot of cases, some of the ways that these decks could have been improved. Now, since there are two decks, there are going to be two separate videos in which I'm going to be opening these up and showing you. Now, if you've seen the other Planeswalker deck opening I've done for War of the Spark, I'm going to show a time code on screen right now where you can sort of skip ahead because the intros to these decks are essentially the same. They don't really start to become different until I actually start talking about the deck itself. So if you've seen the other one and you want to skip ahead, feel free to skip to this particular time and you can get right into me talking about the deck itself. However, if you've not seen the other Planeswalker deck opening or haven't seen any of the other Planeswalker deck openings I've done before, let me just talk a little bit about what a Planeswalker deck is. These are 60 card standard legal decks which are comprised of the set or expansion that they have been released within. So in this case, they're only going to be cards from War of the Spark inside this particular Planeswalker deck. Now, another thing to point out as well, too, is that these decks are not meant to be super competitive decks. These are very much targeted towards new or casual players who just want to have a bit of fun, have a couple of ready-made decks which you can battle it out with your friends and not really worried about taking them to like a tournament or Friday Night Magic and trying to blow the doors off the format. So yes, if you are a more advanced player or someone who's getting more and more into competitive magic, you may want to sort of look towards the challenger decks if you're looking for a pre-made deck. But if you just want to have some fun with a friend, these are great little decks where you can sort of start out and try to learn magic. As well too, when new Planeswalker decks come out, we always battle them against each other on a show we call the Mana Cave in a series we call the Planeswalker Deck Showdown, where we take all the Planeswalker decks within a certain season battle them out to see which one is going to reign supreme at the end of the season. Okay, so everything else I pretty much want to talk about when it comes to the Planeswalker decks, it's a lot easier to do as I'm opening them up and showing you what's inside. So we're going to kick off the actual opening part of this deck. And in this video, we're going to be tackling the Gideon the Oathsworn deck. Okay, first and foremost, as you can see on the outside of the box, and as you're going to be able to see in just a second on the inside of the box, there is a nice foil featured Planeswalker in this deck. So yes, it is foil, nice and shiny, which means sadly it's probably going to start curling right away, but for now it's it's rather flat because it's in the packaging. Uh, I'll talk more about that in just a bit when I start going over the deck itself. There's also this nice, lovely deck box which comes with each of the Planeswalker decks. You can fit sleeved cards in here, so you can sleeve up this deck and put it in this box. Now some people have said that they've had some issues with it. Um, if you're using like Dragon Shield sleeves, standard Dragon Shield sleeves, you shouldn't have any problem sleeving them up and fitting them all in this box. So that should work out just perfect for you. I use Dragon Shield sleeves. I've also used some of the Ultra Pro sleeves as well too, and they all basically seem to fit as long as they're sort of a standard size. Now inside the box, you can actually see the brick of cards, which is the deck itself. Once again, I'm gonna open that up in a second. I'm gonna be talking about the deck, but there's also a few other cards in there that I'm gonna be talking about in just a moment as well. There's also two booster packs of War of the Spark. So I'm gonna be opening those up at the end of the video after I sort of go over the deck itself. As well, too, there is this little full color fold out, which talks a bit about the Planeswalker from the deck. Also mentions some of the mechanics you will find within this deck. They used to have the deck lists printed on these things. They don't anymore, so they're not quite as useful as they may have been at one point. However, if you're brand new to Magic and you're completely unaware of any of the mechanics, this could actually be a bit useful for you. Okay, now, before I get into talking about the Planeswalker and the deck itself, there are a few additional cards sealed up in this little brick that I do want to sort of discuss because they can be quite useful, especially one card in particular, which I think is a great addition to these Planeswalker decks. Now, originally with the Planeswalker decks, as well as a lot of the pre-con decks, there was this little sort of fold out, which would go over some of the basic rules of magic, including uh, what you can do in your turn and when and that sort of thing. They since replaced that with a, a couple of extra cards that they include with these decks instead. So as you can see here, this card talks about how to cast spells, and on the other side, there is the ins and outs of attacking and blocking. Uh, this card, on the other hand, talks about what you can do on your turn and the various phases within a turn of magic. And it also mentions a website in the back, learnmagic.wizards.com, where you can learn a bit more about magic and how to play. 
Now, while those cards are nice and can be to a certain degree rather useful, especially for very, very new players, the card in here that I think is the most important, especially if you are already on Magic Arena, is this card. Not this side that I'm showing you right now, but the other side here, which has a special code that you can enter into your Magic Arena account and you will be able to get a copy of this Planeswalker deck in digital form. So it basically doubles up the uh, usefulness of one of these Planeswalker decks. Now you can play it on paper with your friends, or you can play it online on Magic Arena with your friends. So if you haven't started playing Magic Arena, they're, they're not a sponsor, so I'm not saying this because they're a sponsor or anything like that, but I would definitely suggest uh, you, you sort of try Magic Arena out because you don't necessarily have to pay anything if you don't want to, and things like this allow you to sort of build up a collection and get into playing fairly quickly for zero money involved. And if you do want to invest some money into it, you know, you can try different things like different drafts and what have you, but there are also other ways to earn currency within that game, gain more cards, play more different types of decks. So yeah, it's definitely something that, that's worth checking out, especially if you're a big fan of Magic or if you're getting into it and you may want a, another avenue to learn a bit more or to play a bit more. Okay, so now that I am done talking about everything that isn't the Planeswalker and the actual cards within this deck, let's talk about the deck itself. Now, I'm going to do this by starting off with the Planeswalker, and then I'm going to talk about the cards that are exclusive to this deck that you're not going to be able to find in regular booster packs. Then I'm going to go through the creatures, the non-creature spells, and eventually the land base. And all of that I'm going to go through in order of converted mana cost. Oh yeah, and as well too, I am going to go over one additional Planeswalker, which is in this deck. So I will do that right after talking about the cards that are exclusive to this deck. Alrighty, so here we go, folks. We're going to start off by talking about Gideon the Oathsworn. Gideon costs four and two white for a four loyalty Planeswalker. His static ability, which is always in effect as long as he's on the board, is whenever you attack with two or more non-Gideon creatures, put a plus one, plus one counter on each of those creatures. His plus two is... Until the end of turn, Gideon the Oathsworn becomes a 5-5 white soldier creature that's still a planeswalker. Prevent all damage that will be dealt to him this turn. One thing to keep in mind, he can't attack if he was cast this turn. So he does suffer from summoning sickness if you turn him into a creature on the first turn he's come into play. His minus 9 ability, which, to be honest, you almost never get a chance to use, is Exile Gideon the Oathsworn and each creature your opponent controls. So even though it's very rare that you're able to get off your ultimate, in this case, it's pretty effective. You do lose Gideon, but you're going to not only destroy, but exile all of your opponent's creatures. If this doesn't win you the game outright, then it should at the very least put you in a position where you can have one hell of a comeback after you're able to use it. However, like I said, it's unlikely that this is ever going to be able to get off in a game, but you are going to still be able to use his plus two ability fairly often. So he becomes a 5-5 with what is essentially indestructible. So what this does is put a lot of pressure on your opponent. If they don't have a creature big enough to block Gideon and prevent the damage from going through that's going to survive, they either have to make the choice of taking five damage each turn or throwing something under the bus and losing a creature as a chump blocker, which is not great because it's going to lower their board state. So his ability is very, very significant, even though he can't attack the first turn he comes into play. However, even ignoring his loyalty abilities, his static ability makes this card so worthwhile to have on the battlefield. All you need is two or more creatures to be swinging in, and they're going to get plus one, plus one counters each and every time they do so. This is even more effective in a deck like this, which, as you're going to see in a little while, given the fact that there are so many other cards which allow you to put plus one, plus one counters on them. So this is just one other way to buff up your small army and overwhelm your opponent. Now, the only downside to Gideon the Oathsworn is the same thing that has been sort of built into all of the Planeswalkers from these Planeswalker decks, and that's the fact that it costs just a bit too much. Four and two white, given the abilities, even though these are great abilities, is just a little high. Now, that's done by design because they don't want the Planeswalkers in these decks to become huge standard staples. So they have to do something. They want them to have cool abilities, but they have to do something so that they won't take like the tournament world by storm. So there is where the cost comes in. However, if you are playing against other Planeswalker decks, and there's a good chance you will be with this deck, you're not going to have to worry about that too much because their Planeswalkers are probably going to cost just about the same amount as well. Okay, so now that we've talked about the feature Planeswalker, let's move on to the four cards which are exclusive to this deck that cannot be found in regular booster packs. Let's start with Gideon's Battle Cry. Now, I'm going to start with this one because it's a type of card that you're going to see in just about every single Planeswalker deck, with the exception of the ones from M19. For two and two white, you get a sorcery. Put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. You may search your library 
and graveyard for a card named Gideon the Oathsworn, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. So these types of cards, which search your library or your graveyard, they're often referred to as tutor cards. And all these Planeswalker decks have a tutor card like this. Now, the extra effect is often different, and sometimes the form of them is a bit different. This is a sorcery, sometimes they're instants, sometimes they're artifacts, sometimes they're even creatures. But there's always something like this in the Planeswalker decks, which allow you to hunt for and grab your Planeswalker from, once again, either the library or the graveyard. Now, the graveyard aspect of this is important because even though you only get one copy of Gideon in this deck, it means you have a chance of casting him more than once per game. As well, too, ignoring the tutor effect, the regular effect from this card with this type of deck, which I talked about before, which is meant to spread out creatures on the board and swarm your opponent, is extremely effective. Very similar to Gideon's static ability. Put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control, allowing you to buff up your army of smaller creatures into bigger creatures and overwhelm your opponent quickly. One final note on this card is it does cost four while Gideon costs six. So if you do cast this on turn of four, you are gonna have to wait two full turns to get Gideon out. But the effect in this card makes it so this card actually could be quite useful even on turn four. Oh yes, and you do get two copies of Gideon's Battle Cry. Okay, moving on to the next card, which is exclusive to this deck, we have Desperate Lunge. For one and a white, it's an instant target creature gets plus two, plus two, and gains flying into the end of turn. You gain two life. First, let's talk about the buff ability, the plus two, plus two, and gains flying to the end of turn. This is very useful if you have a blocker which doesn't have flying, and your opponent is swinging with a flying creature. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden, your creature is now a contender to block that creature. Very nice surprise to play on your opponent when it's their turn to attack. However, you can even use this before your attack to give one of your creatures flying to fly over top of your opponent's creatures, and it buffs them as well, too. So this is something where you can swing in out of nowhere for lethal in a board which didn't look like you'd be able to get through anyways. Now with the life gain aspect, normally when you sort of tack on life gain into a card, unless your deck is sort of built around life gain or has some sort of bonuses from life gain, it doesn't really mean that much in the overall aspect of the game. However, this deck does have a life gain sub theme. There are creatures which gain you life or cards that gain you life, but more importantly, there are cards and creatures which get benefits if you gain life. So a card like this can have an added effect with any number of other cards which could be on the battlefield. And given the fact that there are four copies of this card in the deck, it means that there's a very good chance that you will have it in your hand pretty much at any moment you may want it. And last but not least, when it comes to the exclusive cards in this deck, we have Gideon's Company. For three and one white, you get a 3-3 three, three human soldier. Whenever you gain life, put two plus one plus one counters on Gideon's Company. It also has the ability, a non-tap ability, for three and one white, put a loyalty counter on target Gideon Planeswalker. So there are a few things I want to talk about with this card. This is an example of one of those cards which benefits when you gain life. And it benefits quite well. Two plus one plus one counters every instance you gain life. Now it's important to note as well too for newer players that there is a difference between the instances in which you gain life and the amount of life you gain. So if you gain five life, this is not going to trigger five times. That's going to be one instance that you gain five life. However, if three separate sources independently gain you one life each time, like three creatures that have lifelink, for example, all attack. Those are each separate instances of gaining life. That means this is gonna trigger three times. So yeah, this creature can get out of hand pretty quick, especially in a deck like this that has so many different avenues for you to gain life. And its second ability, which is often referred to as a mana sink, because it allows you to sink unused mana that you may have available to you and do something with it each and every turn, to put a loyalty counter on target Gideon Planeswalker. So if Gideon is out, obviously this card gets better. And this is one of the sort of themes within these exclusive cards. There's always a card which is going to benefit you if you have Gideon out there. Now, unlike with Gideon's Battle Cry, this is not specific to Gideon the Oath Sworn. This is simply a Gideon Planeswalker. So it could be any of the Gideon Planeswalkers that have ever been created. This gives you a bit more flexibility with this card. So Gideon's Battle Cry may only be really, really useful in this specific Planeswalker deck. This card could potentially be useful in other decks that run Gideon. Another thing I like about Gideon's Company is the fact that they give you three copies of it in this deck, which means that there's a very good chance you'll have it in hand by the time you can cast it on turn four. So now that we've talked about the exclusive cards in this deck, before we move on to the creatures, let's talk about the only other Planeswalker you'll find in this deck. And it's one of the uncommon Planeswalkers. That's something new to War of the Spark. Before this, there was never uncommon Planeswalkers. Now there are a ton of them. And in this case, we have Kaya Bane of the Dead. For three and either three white or black, you get a seven loyalty planeswalker. Her static ability is your opponents and permanents your opponents control with hexproof 
can be the target of spells and abilities you control as though it didn't have hexproof. And her minus three is exiled target creature. So her static ability probably isn't going to have that much of an impact on a lot of games. I mean, it could because it depends on the, the deck that you're playing against. For example, the Jace Planeswalker deck from War of the Spark, there is at least one creature that does have hexproof. So that may make this a bit more useful. But typically, that's not going to be the case with this card. The big draw of this particular Planeswalker hitting the battlefield is it essentially has two charges to exile target creature. And because pretty much all of these Planeswalker decks are rather creature centric, any type of removal you may have in your toolkit is going to be a huge benefit to you. Now, unfortunately, you only get one copy of Kaya Bane of the Dead in your deck, but it does cost six. So you're not going to want her or need her in your hand right away anyways. So that gives you time to eventually find her naturally through card draw. Plus, her ability, like I mentioned before, can be triggered twice, so even though there's only one copy of her, she basically has the effect of two bits of removal. And that's one of the things I really like about this particular Planeswalker deck, is it has a lot of removal to back up its creatures. Speaking of which, now that we talked about the exclusive cards and the Planeswalker cards, let's talk about the creatures in order of converted mana cost. So kicking things off, we have four copies of a one-dropped, it is Charmed Stray. For one white, you get a 1-1 one, one cat creature with lifelink, when it enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on each other creature you control named Charmed Stray. First of all, it has Lifelink, which is going to activate a bunch of your cards, some of which we talked about, some of which we haven't got to quite yet, but it is definitely an important part of this deck. There's also the plus one plus one counter aspect. So on turn one, you have a one one. If you happen to cast this as well too on turn two, you now have a one one and a two two. Given the potential of this card, by turn four, you could have a 1-1, one, one, a 2-2, two, two, a 3-3, three, three, and a 4-4 four, four all on the board for the cost of only 4 mana in total. Now, it's highly unlikely it will ever work out like that for you by turn 4, but it's still something which applies a lot of pressure if you're only able to get a couple of them out on the board early on. So moving now on to the 2-drops, we have probably the most important creature in this deck to be able to get out there nice and early, and that is Johnny's Pride Mate. For 1 and 1 white, you get a 2-2 two, two Cat Soldier. And it has, whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on a Johnny's Pride Mate. Now, if you've ever faced a white weenie deck, chances are you've played against a Johnny's Pride Mate. And you know how crazy this card can get if it's not checked early. If you get Charm Stray out on one, a Johnny's Pride Mate out on two. You swing in with the Stray on turn two, Johnny's Pride Mate becomes a 3-3. Three, three, and it's just going to get bigger from there. Life gain is rampant in this deck and a Johnny's Pride Mate is just going to be sucking up all that life gain and buffing itself up with it. And they provide you with three copies of it in this deck, so there is a very good chance you could start off with this in your opening hand, and it's definitely one of those cards that you want in your opening hand. Moving on now to another two-drop creature that they put three copies of in this deck, we have Cruel Celebrant. It's a multicolored card. For one white and one black, you get a 1-2 Vampire. Whenever a Cruel Celebrant or another creature or Planeswalker you control dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So yeah, the only thing better in a deck like this than life gain is life gain, which is also going to hurt your opponent at the same time. Granted, it's it's not a good fighter when it hits the battlefield, but it's also not meant to be. It's meant to hang back and just basically punish your opponent for every time they take one of your creatures or planeswalkers off the board. Next up, we have another two drop, which is also another vampire, but there's only one copy of this in the deck. It is Vampire Opportunist. For one and one black, you get a 2-1 vampire creature, and it has the mana sync ability of pay six, one black. Each opponent loses two life, and you gain two life. Like I mentioned with the Celebrant, the only thing better than life gain is life gain that also hurts your opponent. Now, this is not something that you're going to be able to do much with early on. At most, it's going to be like a chump blocker at the very early part of the game. But if this shows up later in the game, maybe during a stalemate where no one's really able to swing in and do much as far as damage goes during combat, and this hits the board, if you have the mana to pump into this thing turn after turn, you're going to put your opponent on a clock whether you swing in to attack or not. And you're going to be keep gaining life each and every turn, which can activate other things like the Ajani's Pride Mate. So don't discount this card, even though very early on, it's not going to be anywhere near as useful as it will be later in the game. And then the final two-drop creature, we have War Screecher. For one and one white, you get a 1-3 bird creature with flying. It also has pay five and a white, tap it, other creatures you control get plus one, plus one at the end of turn. Now, I'm not super crazy about this particular creature. The fact that the ability costs six and you do have to tap it in order for it to go off isn't the greatest. It means it's not going to be super useful, especially if you want to attack with it. 
Still, a 1-3 flyer for two isn't really the worst card in the world either. It can start swinging over your opponent's creatures early on and start pecking away at them. So overall, by far, it's not the best card, but it's not the worst card either. It's, it's just, it's an okay card, and there is only one copy of it in the deck. Next up, we have the three drop creatures, and we've got Makeshift Battalion. You get three copies of this three drop. For two and one white, you get a 3-2 human soldier. And it has, whenever Makeshift Battalion and at least two other creatures attack, put a plus one, plus one counter on Makeshift Battalion. So yes, you do have to jump through a few hoops in order to put a plus one, plus one counter on Makeshift Battalion. Unlike with the Johnny's Primate, where you simply have to hang back and gain some life, you do have to swing in with three creatures. But... That's not exactly outside the realm of possibilities with a deck like this because there are so many creatures that could potentially swing in early that you may not care about as long as it buffs up the battalion. So not unlike the worst creature, I don't consider this to be the best card ever, but it's also not the worst card you could possibly get into your hand. However, the only other three drop creature we have in this deck I do quite like. There are two copies of Trusted Pegasus. For two and one white, you get a 2-2 two -two flying Pegasus creature. Whenever Trusted Pegasus attacks, target attacking creature without flying gains flying until the end of turn. Now, I've played with this card a fair amount in limited play, both in draft and in sealed, and it can be extremely useful. Allowing one of your other creatures that doesn't have flying to have flying, a lot of the times means that you're going to be getting in for a lot of free extra damage each and every turn with a creature which otherwise would never have been able to swing in safely. Okay, so we're going to jump past the four drop spot because we've already talked about the only four drop creature in this deck, Gideon's Company, and head on over to the five drops. There are two copies of Enforcer Griffin. For four and one white, you get a three, four Griffin with flying. So this is just a very basic vanilla creature. If you're, if you're unfamiliar with the term vanilla when it comes to creatures in Magic or other card games, it's basically a creature that doesn't really have anything extra special about it. Granted, it does have flying, but it doesn't have any sort of extra abilities like Gideon's Company or Makeshift Battalion or a Johnny's Pride Mate. It hits the board as a three, four flyer, stays that way. For five mana, it's not the worst, it's not the best. It's just a decent creature to be on the board a little bit later in the game. It can fly over your opponent's defenders and hopefully just peck away at their face. But like I said, that is the final creature in this deck. So now we're going to move on to the non-creature spells in this deck. So there are no one-drop non-creature spells, and we've already talked about the only two-drop non-creature spell in the deck, Desperate Lunge. So let's head over to the three-drop spot and talk about Oath of Kaya. So for one, a white, and a black, you get a legendary enchantment. When Oath of Kaya enters the battlefield, it deals three damage to any target, and you gain three life. When an opponent attacks a planeswalker you control with one or more creatures, Oath of Kaya deals two damage to that player, and you gain two life. So this is another example of a card which has both a static effect, which stays into play as long as it's in play, as well as an effect that happens once it's cast. Now, the casting effect of this, dealing three damage to any target and you gaining three life, is useful. It's a form of removal. Plus, with it being able to deal damage to any target, that means creatures, your opponent, or their planeswalkers. So there's a lot of versatility there. It's only three damage, but a lot of the times that's enough to knock out one of your opponent's creatures or knock out their planeswalker who may be down to its last few loyalty. Now, the static ability may not seem like much, especially since you only have two planeswalkers in this deck. But keep in mind, once you do get a planeswalker on the battlefield, typically your opponents want to get it off the battlefield as quickly as possible. And this triggers if they simply attack one of your planeswalkers. They don't have to do damage to it, they simply have to attack it. So it's going to trigger whether they're able to knock your planeswalker out or not. And a lot of the times, you will have blockers to prevent the damage from going through. So your opponent swings into your planeswalkers, you block it. Even if you lose your creature, your planeswalker sticks around, you're dealing two damage to them, and you're gaining two life, which is going to help a bunch of your other creatures, which could potentially be on the board at that time, soaking up that life gain and getting bigger. So yes, this might be one of those cards which at first glance you sort of dismiss as not being super useful in the deck, but trust me, this could actually have a decent impact on the game. Next up in the three drop spot, we have Ob Nixilis's Cruelty. For two and one black, you get an instant. Target creature gets minus five, minus five at the end of turn. If that creature would die this turn, exile it instead. This card is a great piece of removal. It's cheap, it's instant, and even though it's not unconditional removal, you do have to give something minus five, minus five, chances are that's enough to kill almost any creature anyways. And it doesn't destroy the creature, it exiles it instead. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, removal in these Planeswalker decks is typically king, so this is a very nice addition to this deck. 
Okay, so just like we did with the creatures, we are going to jump over the four drop spot because we've already talked about the only four drop non-creature spell, Gideon's Battle Cry. And instead, we're going to jump right into the five drops with one copy of Bond of Discipline. For four and one white, you get a sorcery. Tap all creatures your opponents control. Creatures you control gain lifelink until the end of turn. So yes, this is one of those mid to late game cards, which if you've got some sort of board stall going where no one's able to attack and you're able to cast this, it's pretty much going to end the game. So not only does it clear the road for you to do a massive attack, even if you're not able to do lethal with that attack, chances are the life you gain from that attack would make the attack more than worthwhile and impossible for your opponents to kill you on the crackback. So yeah, when I saw this card was in the deck, I immediately thought, you know what, this, this is probably the card that's going to kill me when I square off against this deck in the mana cave. That was until I saw the final non-creature spell in this deck, and then I realized, no, that's the card that's probably going to kill me in the end. And that card is in the six drop spot. It is Command the Dread Horde. For four and two black, you have a sorcery. Choose any number of target creature and or planeswalker cards in graveyards. Command the Dread Horde deals damage to you equal to the total converted mana cost of those cards. Put them onto the battlefield under your control. Now it's possible at first glance some of you may think that the drawback for this card is too costly for it to be useful. Now, unless you have an extremely low life total, trust me, this card is absolutely bonkers. First of all, it targets both creatures in your opponent's graveyard as well as your own. So you can cherry pick the best creatures that have died during the entire game, no matter whose creatures they are. The other thing to note is that specifically with this deck that you're running, you have so many low cost yet still potentially powerful creatures that it's not really going to cost you that much life to bring back a small army onto your battlefield. For example, let's say you want to bring back four copies of Charm Stray and one of Johnny's Pride Mate. That's going to give you a 1-1, one, one, a 2-2, two, two, a 3-3, three, three, a 4-4, four, four, all with lifelink, and a Johnny's Pride Mate, which gains benefit when you gain life. So you now have this nice little board, most of it with lifelink, and the other thing that benefits from lifelink, and it only costs you six life. As well too, don't forget, this can also target Planeswalkers. Now granted, the Planeswalkers in this deck do cost six, so that may be a bit costly, especially when you weigh it against how many creatures you get on the board for that same amount of life, but it could be possible that Kaya getting back on the battlefield for six life may be worth it to you in the game. And finally, keep in mind, this is a card that's going to be cast possibly on turn six during a game where you will most likely have been gaining a lot of extra life all game. So chances are you're only going to have to spend the surplus of life that you've gained throughout the game. So yeah, trust me, from my limited experience of playing this card in Sealed, it is a great card. It's an amazing addition to this deck. I'm actually kind of surprised it's in a Planeswalker deck. But yeah, it is, it is absolutely wonderful. Okay, so that is it for all the creature and non-creature spells, the Planeswalkers, everything in this deck except for the mana base. So let's quickly go over what land is in this deck. You have four copies of Orzhov Guildgate, 12 planes, and finally, eight swamps. Okay, so now that I've talked about every single card in this deck, I'll give my overall thoughts on the deck and let you know how I feel about this and how it stacks up to other Planeswalker decks that I've sort of seen before, how it stacks up specifically against the Jace deck for more of the Sparks. But before I do that, let's jump to the dessert of this video and open up those two packs of War of the Sparks. Now, I'm going to switch microphones when I do the pack opening part, so there might be a slight change in my voice, but hopefully that's not too distracting and it will end once the packs have been opened. Okay, so because there's only two packs, I'm going to read off each card. Well, I'm going to read off the name of each card, and then I'm going to fully read off each Planeswalker as well as the rare or any mythic cards that are in these packs. So we're going to start off with the Liliana pack and see what's inside. Okay, so this is the first physical booster pack of War of the Spark I have ever opened, so I'm kind of excited about it. We have Blind Blast as our first card, Battlefield Promotion, Crush Descent, Ward Scale Crocodile, Spark Reaper, Herald of the Dread Horde, Gateway Plaza, Tamayos, and I apologize for pronouncing that wrong. Uh, Epiphany, Trusted Pegasus, we got Gideon in there, and our first uncommon is Death Sprout. it's actually a card I'm enjoying playing so far, uh, Emergency Zone, sorry, Emergence Zone, and not Emergency Zone, and our 
uncommon planeswalker is Sahili Sublime Artificer. So for one and two hybrid of either blue or red, it's a five loyalty planeswalker. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 colorless servo artifact creature token. The minus two is target, target, if I can say it, <laughs> I'll, I'll get it out there, target artifact you control becomes a copy of another target artifact or creature you control until the end of turn, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. And then our rare card is Storev Devkarin Lich. So for one, two black and a green, you get a 5-4 zombie elf wizard, has trample, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, return to your hand target creature or planeswalker card in your graveyard that wasn't put there this combat. So this card, because specifically because it has trample, can be absolutely amazing. I did get to uh, play around with this a little bit in uh, one of the early release events. So uh, yeah, this card this card can be pretty nice, especially in draft. I don't know how good it's going to be in constructed, but I know in draft or sealed, this can actually be uh, quite quite a bit of a bomb when it hits the battlefield, unless your opponents are able to stop it before it swings in for the first time. And then we have, oh, we have a foil, a foil swap. Well, I mean, I guess as far as foils go, you could do a lot better than a land, but uh, still a foil swamp there. And then we have the island. And then our token is one of the devils, one of the one, one devils. So when this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target creature. Oh, before I forget, um, we also create tokens here on Brain Pulp TV. We have what we call the token of the month club. So it's a little thing you could sign up for. It's completely optional. You don't have to if you don't want to. But if you're a fan of tokens, uh, we have... Uh, exclusive tokens created just for Brain Pulp TV. There is a new one each and every month. I believe the token that's going to be coming out in May is going to be uh, a Mass Army tokens. So that will be sort of on theme with the new set. Uh, that There's a slight chance that may change depending on scheduling. But uh, if it's not out in May, then that one should be out in June. But yes, something to check out. There'll be a link in the description and there'll be a link sort of popping up in the corner of the screen as well too if you want to check that out. Okay, no more of that spiel. Let's move on to the second and final pack from this Planeswalker deck box. So open this sucker up. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to read off the name of each of the cards and then fully read off any Planeswalkers and then the rare and or mythic. So we have Teo's Light Shield, Spellkeeper Weird, Turret Ogre, Pouncing Lynx, Return to Nature, Shriek Diver, Prismite, Spark Harvest, Thundering Ceratok, Nahiri's Stone Blades. Our first uncommon is Heartwarming Redemption. Bolt Bend. And we have one of the uncommon planeswalkers here. It is the Wanderer. So for three and a white, you get a five loyalty planeswalker. The static ability is prevent all non all non-combat damage. I'm having the worst time talking. Uh, that would be dealt to you and other permanents you control. And the minus two is exile target creature with power four or greater. This card uh, really sort of uh, messed me over in one of the early release events because I, 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 these planeswalkers, once they use their minus loyalty abilities, sometimes they just sort of sit on the battlefield and you don't think, ah, it's not worth getting it off the battlefield. So the Wanderer was on the battlefield with only one loyalty, so it couldn't do the exile target creature with power four or greater anymore and I completely forgot about its static ability. And I tried to use Burn to remove one of my opponent's creatures, and of course, it didn't work, and I felt incredibly foolish. So always keep an eye out for the Wanderer if uh, she's on the battlefield, because it can cause quite a problem for you if you have any sort of non-unconditional uh, removal, like any sort of Burn removal or something like that. So, and our rare card is, it is the Silent Submersible. So for two blue, you get a two, three artifact vehicle. When it deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, draw a card. And the crew cost is two. Then we have a planes, and our token is one of the zombie army tokens. Yeah, so this is this is going to be a very uh, useful token with a mass, because a mass is such a big part of this set. This looks like it is the second... There, there are three versions of this. There's one where it's just him, and I think one sort of hiding in the background. And then slowly there's an army that builds up. I think this is the second version just before the army gets really huge in the background of this token. So glad to have a copy of this, even though there will be one coming out with the um, 
Token of the Month Club soon. So, and then we have an advertisement for a book that I'm actually excited to uh, to check out. I Sadly, due to my work, I get to actually listen to audiobooks when I work a lot of the time. I don't get a whole lot of chance to read, so I'm going to have to wait for this to be on uh, the audiobook version, but I am excited for the book to come out. Okay, so now that I've cracked open a couple packs, time for me to give my overall thoughts on this deck. Now, keep in mind, when I talk about Planeswalker decks, I'm going to talk about them in a different way than I would like a Challenger deck, a deck that's meant to be competitive. These decks are for casual players, for newer players, so I hold them to a different sort of standard than I would a Challenger deck. So when I say something is powerful, it's powerful based on other Planeswalker decks. Now that I've got that little disclaimer out of the way, let me just say that this is probably one of the strongest Planeswalker decks that they've built to date. Granted, I haven't had a chance to play it against other decks yet, but just based on the actual deck list, the cards that I've seen, and the fact that it seems to be based a lot on a strategy that I've seen played in Standard, the, the black, white, weenie life gain strategy can be very, very powerful. I've played decks that use it. I've played against decks that use it. This deck seems to be based on those types of decks. It's got a lot of creatures and cards that have great synergy with one another. It's got a bunch of removal. The Gideon Planeswalker is quite powerful. The static ability from it is amazing. His plus two ability is nothing to sneeze at as well too. It has Kaya in it, which is like at least two bits of removal. Well, I shouldn't say at least. It's potentially two bits of removal tacked onto a single Planeswalker. All these other cards that work really well together, it's just, it's it seems like it's going to be a very strong Planeswalker deck, especially when stacked up against the Jace Planeswalker deck from War of the Spark. Once again, the blue decks, which I actually prefer playing in general, seem to get the short end of the stick when it comes to the Planeswalker decks in this set. And uh, yeah, I'll talk more about the Jace Planeswalker deck, obviously, in its own video. But there, I don't think there's any real comparison between the two. I don't think the Jace Planeswalker deck is the worst one they've ever created. But I don't see it stacking up too well against this one. Now, I'm definitely not saying that there aren't ways to improve this deck. If you want to sink a bit of extra money in this deck, you could definitely take this deck from what is already a decent Planeswalker deck and possibly pump it up to something that maybe you could potentially use on Friday Night Magic or something like that. Basically, what you'd be doing is taking the best elements of this deck that work with an already existing type of deck, which is like, once again, the life game style white weenie deck, and, you know, taking the best cards of that deck and putting them in here. Stuff like Legion's Landing, Dawn of Hope. So those types of cards, which you've already seen in, in some life game weenie decks, could definitely be added to this deck, and some of the more vanilla creatures like Enforcer Griffin or War Screecher can get taken out. You can also put in uh, a bit more removal as well, too, if you want to, like maybe like board sweepers, like Cleansing Nova or Settle the Wreckage. Now, some of these cards are going to cost you a couple bucks, but overall, the impact you could have on this deck is amazing. So definitely something to look out for. Now, I realize that's very sort of basic information. Look up a deck list and learn from that. But that's sort of how you can learn deck building. If you're brand new to the game, you're not going to instinctively know how to deck build. So take a look at this deck. Go, okay, I've played this a few times. What's worked for me? The life gain. Is there any other cards that benefit from life gain or gain me life gain? And then just do a search on Wizards Gatherer, which is a wonderful resource for you to be able to look up cards based on keywords and things like that. And you can take those cards which you think might work in that deck, most of which are going to be super cheap, add to this deck and see what works. Now, not every change you make is going to be amazing. Not every change you make is going to elevate this to some sort of tournament breaking deck. But the more you do it and the more you sort of test things out, throw things at the wall, see what works and doesn't work, it's going to make you a better player. It's going to make you a better deck builder. So yes, once again, I realize this is all very general information, but hopefully it's information which does help some of you out there because like I said, a lot of people who are interested in these particular types of videos are newer players. So I think any type of information could be useful. So there you go, folks. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found it a bit informative. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns in the comments section. You can also just let me know how your pre-release went or if you've had a chance to play around with these decks. Do you agree with my assessment of the decks? Do you think maybe I was wrong about which deck is stronger than the other one? Please let me know all those things in the comments section below because I'd love to hear from you guys. You can also follow or contact me on Twitter at BrainPulpTV or you can just email me ed at BrainPulp.TV. Oh, and uh, one more thing before we go, I did sort of briefly touch upon it at the beginning of the video, but we are going to be battling it out with these two decks on the live Paper Magic show that we do here on Brain Pulp TV called The Mana Cave. So that's something to definitely keep an eye out for. Hopefully that should be released sometime within a week of this video being released. 
Alrighty, so now with all that said, take care, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day, night, morning, evening, whatever it is, wherever you are. May all your pulls be mythics, and I'll see you all again very soon.